How's it going, Spare Parts Army? I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy, and today we're going to examine whether or not the U.S. military's M1 Abrams main battle tank is still fit for modern warfare. Or is it an overly vulnerable, exposed hunk of metal waiting to get destroyed by next-generation anti-tank systems like the Russian counterparts? In order to answer this question, we'll take a look at the Abrams' crew training, armor, cannon capabilities, and the vehicle's historical development. Recently, the United States started to share their most modern, high-tech version of the M1A2 SEP-3 Abrams with their NATO allies. So they agreed to sell 250 of these to Poland on February 18th, 2022, just a few days before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The US usually only sells the older A1 versions to any foreign countries. But will this make much of a difference? Has the Abrams evolved enough since its creation to still be effective against a near-peer ally, or are they doomed to the same fate as the Russian tanks in Ukraine? Load a high-explosive round into your smoothbore cannon and fire off a shell at the like and subscribe button because these are the questions that we're going to try to answer in this video. Back when the M1 Abrams was only a drawing on a sheet of paper, the world was a very different place. The Cold War had just started, and most sovereign countries had moved away from the old tank philosophies of World War II that involved light, medium, and heavy tanks, and instead they were moving to this revolutionary concept of the main battle tank because it would consolidate, simplify, and streamline streamline all of your parts into one common chassis. I read a 1982 research paper created by the US Army about the lessons learned during the development of the original Abrams tank, and they outline exactly why the US Abrams will always be better than any Russian tank. Quote, the M1 Abrams tank system acquisition strategy reflected guidance concerning competition, international collaboration, accelerated development, and an intense design to cost." End quote. So the line that really stuck out to me there that you should pay attention to is about the international collaboration. All of the systems that we're going to examine in this video were created not by just the best minds of the United States but they were created by the best engineers around the entire world collaborating together, and that's something that the Russians don't have access to. If that sounds like the most hippie kumbaya sh you've ever heard, you're absolutely right. The hippie's dream of world collaboration came true, it was just all happening in the defense industry. Now that doesn't mean that the Russian army has no equipment or weapons that they could throw at the Abrams to stop it, that's not what I'm saying, and we're gonna get into that in a minute. This is an investment advice, but we all know there's serious money in the defense industry, especially since the US has sent more than $3 billion in military aid to the Ukraine. As a result, you can see a major spike when looking at the one-year chart of some of these defense companies. This growth is even more impressive when you consider that the overall market has been declining. In light of this new normal, certain platforms have arisen giving access to top alternative asset classes. I'm talking about investing in fine art. The art market has been tactically used as an instrument to protect wealth and defend against inflation for generations. Masterworks is the only platform that allows you to invest in the same artwork as the top tier art collectors. Investing with Masterworks led to a 32% return for their investors in 2020 by selling artwork created by Banksy. It's super easy to get started, it only takes a few clicks. You can have control over how much you want to invest. If you're looking to invest in fine art, there's usually a wait list, but you can skip that line by taking advantage of Masterworks offer to start investing immediately by clicking the link in the description. What kind of design philosophy is the Abrams based around and how does that inform the way that it's evolved over the years? This genesis of the Abrams came out of a collaboration between the US and West Germany, and it was intended to compete against the newer Soviet tanks. The experimental tank project was codenamed the MBT-70, and there was actually 14 different prototypes originally built. In 1969, after six years of working on the project, it was deemed too costly, and it was cancelled. But from the ashes of the failed program came some promising leads. For instance, the chassis and the overall design would be used as a good starting point, so they kept all that. In 1972, when the plans were dusted off and development of the tank began again, the primary threat that it would be engineered to defeat would be the Soviet 125mm cannons on the T-72 family of tanks. So one of the main justifications for finally going through and replacing the M60 with the M1 Abrams was due to the technological deficiencies of the M60 platform with bad optics and a non-stabilized turret. The MBT task force that was created by the Department of Defense was able to convince Congress for the need of a new tank concept, so the Abrams was successfully pushed through the trials this time 
far outpacing many of the requirements. It was originally designed and manufactured by the Chrysler Defense Division. The first ones rolled out in 1978, and they were tested for about two years before being fielded by the first official U.S. Army units on February 28, 1980. It used composite armor that's still classified to this day, but we know it's basically made up of sandwich ceramic armor with a metal frame and several elastic layers. It featured a next generation rolled steel. Now how would that stand up to Russian weapons? My understanding is one of the most advanced Russian anti-tank systems is called the Kornets. And this thing compared to the Javelin is a little bit like a flip phone compared to a smartphone. It usually relies on the old wire guided system instead of the modern auto thermal lock. But that doesn't change the fact that this missile would likely take out an Abrams. The big question on all of our minds here is whether or not this armor would stand up to the N-Law and the Javelin anti-tank system. And the answer is no. It would get destroyed and taken out of the fight just as easily as the Russian tanks. That's why crew training and combined ops warfare is so important, and we'll get into that in a minute. There is one critical aspect that the Abrams has that the Russian tanks don't, which give it a huge advantage and would potentially save it from these anti-tank systems, and that's its fire control system. A fire control system is a computer that takes into account separate sensor data to create a ballistic firing solution. So the Abrams tank takes into account the laser rangefinder data and the stabilized day-night thermal sites data and sends it through a solid state digital computer to interpret and create that ballistic solution. Originally, the Abrams had this smaller 105 millimeter cannon, which kind of actually in the long term ended up as a good thing because it had this effect where the Soviet Union didn't worry about upgrading their armor because they thought that the Americans had this smaller cannon. When the Soviet Union collapsed, their tanks got stuck in the last generation, while the Abrams continued to improve, and they added the new 120mm cannon. There are four crew members in the Abrams, including the commander, gunner, loader, and driver. This is one more crew member than the Russian T-72 tank that uses an autoloader. What kind of crew training, tactics, techniques, and procedures do the Abrams use that set them apart from other tankers in different countries? The YouTuber named The Chieftain is a former tanker, and he gave a great outline of something I'd always wondered about. What is the deal with these tanks that move up to a berm, fire, and then move back? Why do they do that? I hope I don't butcher the Chieftain's explanation here, but my understanding is that this tactic of bounding and firing, the whole point is a tank round can move faster than an incoming missile. So by the time the Abrams fires and moves back, an incoming missile is going to completely miss them. And if you have a platoon of four Abrams coordinating with each other correctly, you've just taken out four enemy tanks. The Abrams uses a 1500 horsepower Lycoming Textron gas turbine engine, which is capable of using different types of fuel in the field, including jet, diesel, gasoline, basically anything that's liquid and it can combust, you can toss it into this thing. It holds a whopping 500 gallons of fuel, which gives it a max operating range of 265 miles. And that's important to remember when you're doing things like planning the logistics of your invasion. The original vehicle had a top speed of 45 miles per hour, and it can go from zero to 19 miles per hour in seven seconds. Not exactly a Tesla Plaid, but it's fast by tank standards. There are downsides to using a turbine engine, but the engine runs really quiet compared to other similar tanks. This is why it was nicknamed Whispering Death. Shh, it's me, Whispering Death. Be super quiet. And that leads us to our next point about how the Abrams has fared in combat so far. But we don't have to imagine how the invasion with an Abrams would play out because we can look at the historical record. From its first adoption by line units to its first day in combat, the Abrams sat unused for about a decade. When the mobilization for the Gulf War began in 1990s, many analysts predicted that the new tank would fail horribly. They thought that it was finicky and too technical. There were problems with logistics. You could really only load one of these into an airplane, so you had to ship them all by sea. There were some problems. It wasn't clear if the Abrams was gonna be an outstanding tank in the beginning. US tanks could destroy enemy tanks beyond 2,500 meters. The enemy T-72 tanks from Iraq could only fire targets up to 2,000 meters. This, combined with the fact that the Iraqi tank crews were poorly trained and only had steel core ammunition with no heat rounds available, meant that they were largely sitting ducks compared to the technologically superior Abrams, even if they had less numbers. The haters were wrong. The Abrams was outstanding. 
The aftermath of the Gulf War resulted in 186 Iraqi tanks destroyed along with 127 Iraqi armored vehicles, zero Abrams were destroyed as a result of enemy fire, General Dynamics land systems started looking into improving the Abrams and by 1990 the M1A2 version was approved for production. The M1A2 gave tank commanders a thermal sight and they completely redesigned the commander weapon station. One of the biggest improvements made was that the addition of the inter-vehicle information system. This was key to helping prevent any future friendly fire incidents because it gives the tank commander better situational awareness into the position of friendly units. By incorporating the onboard position slash navigation system onto a screen that the commander can easily see, this screen visually shows the location of friendly units. A big part of the reason we don't see these vehicle systems in Russian vehicles is partly because they haven't yet figured out how to encrypt their networks correctly. So the M1A2 sends all of the location data straight through the Singar's radio, which is a secure network. The improved version has an improved hunter-killer ability, giving the commander their own personal, independent thermal sight, so they can see wherever they want to look separate from where the gunner's looking. The more optics on your tank, the better, because now you have additional eyes scanning for enemy targets. In modern engagements, one tiny enemy infantry armed with one of the next generation shoulder-fired missiles can knock your tank out. To me, these situational awareness and communication system updates are far more valuable than armor or weapon upgrades. I don't care if you have a 120mm or 150mm cannon, that's not going to win the fight in the modern day. These targeting fire control systems are going to be what makes the difference. But these upgrades to the M1A2 tank with its armor and weapon systems added some additional increased weight to 68 tons and it decreased its max speed down to 41 miles per hour, but it's a well worth it trade-off. During the Iraq sequel, the Abrams got another modular fix to solve problems posed by prolonged urban combat. The Tank Urban Survival Kit, or Tusk, was created by the mid-2000s. They added slats to protect against RPGs to the rear, they also added reactive armor on the sides that can be retrofitted to the vehicle, and a remote-controlled 50 caliber machine gun so the commander doesn't have to open up the hatch to use the weapon. The current and most updated version of the Abrams is the M1A2 Ceph version 3, with the M1A3 variant planned for the future. What would modern combat on the battlefield look like? Russia has lost hundreds of armored vehicles during their invasion of Ukraine, while the US has recovered every single Abrams that was damaged or destroyed in Iraq. And it's hard to compare those two conflicts, of course. This isn't to say that the Abrams is perfect. There's anecdotal evidence that I wasn't able to corroborate that says just over 500 Abrams tanks were sent back to the US to be repaired during the occupation of Iraq. The philosophy of how much emphasis that a military puts into protecting its crew is at the core of a lot of the US military design choices. They prioritize crew safety and survivability more so than other militaries like Russia, who will weigh considerations like cost and manufacturing higher up on the list than crew safety. I wouldn't run off thinking this is because the US military is a bunch of soft-hearted sweethearts who care much more about their troops. I mean, it could be the case but it's more likely that it's a kind of a cold calculation made by design teams that determine that the cost of training US tanker crews is incredibly high. The tanker crew's knowledge and experience of operating the vehicle is actually more valuable than the M1 tank itself. It's easy to replace a tank, it's very difficult to replace a crew, especially when you consider all the very difficult technological systems and tactics that they have to learn. So what do you guys think? Does NATO stand a chance against Russia with their armor? So thank you for watching Task and Purpose. I'm Chris Cappy. Be sure to grab some of our cool merch like this tactical musket t-shirt, and you can click on this playlist here to watch all of our military vehicle videos.